All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Maddie Hornsby. I'm the project manager for the Riot organization. Welcome to the Riot Lunch and Learn series, the place where we spotlight Riot sponsors. Today, we have with us Rob Holt from iCertify to speak about design for compliance principles for IoT devices. Just a couple of quick reminders before we get started. This event is being recorded and will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and uploaded to the meetup page where you registered for this event. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just throw it in the chat and then Rob will answer those at the end of the presentation. And then please keep yourself muted throughout the event. That's all for me. So Rob, I will go ahead and throw it over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Maddie. Welcome everybody. Um, I guess the first uh, order of business would be to talk a little bit about iCertify. I assume everybody on the call knows about Riot if, you, if you're a member, um, but we are a um, regulatory compliance firm um, covering everything from concept to certification. So we have our own design for compliance uh, services. Uh, some of the things that we suggest will be covered in this uh, webinar. Um, we also do pro, pro project management, uh, whether it be for the base countries, um, but there's other disciplines that we can project manage. Um, program management solutions. Um, of course, one of our skill sets going back 10 years uh, is global certifications and type approvals. We have a number of different in-country representation options for some of those international countries and local holder services as well. Um, some of the things we can also provide are relator, regulatory conformance intelligence. So let's say you've got uh, 20 countries and you have a wireless device, you need to know, um, you know the matrix of different um, frequency allocation, um, channel spacings and power levels. And we can create reports based on your product type for those markets. Um, we also have authorized representative services, which is a new thing now in Europe and soon in UK. And we have a, a, a homegrown solution for uh, best practice when it comes to a regulatory uh, documentation uh, certification management. So we're talking you know, cert certificates, DOCs, reports. You can have a, one repository that is um, offsite. And the, one of the benefits of that is there's, uh, there's algorithms to alert you to when certain terms are about to expire, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, so let's talk about one of the problems that we see when a startup is about to um, start manufacturing devices. And one of the things that I've seen in my 36 years of doing this is, you know, you start off with an executive who manages compliance uh, as well as many other things, but at a certain point, th their bandwidth gets overloaded. There's so many other things competing for their time and attention and they get you know, overwhelmed. And so at a certain point, regulatory tasks are delegated to one person or, or more people, depending on how fast the, the company grows. Um, but Here's where the rub is. Even though they delegate that to someone else, um, Europe requires that uh, an officer of the company is the one that signs the DOC. So we have this disconnect there between the person who's actually doing the work and the one who signs off on the uh, DOC. Um, and you know what I've seen also as companies grow is that you'll have uh, a designer who specs in parts and generates schematics, another one that does validation, manages maybe pre-compliances and, and, and formal testing. Um, and then at some point you'll have somebody focus on, you know, integrating the module, validating the antenna and, and focus on that aspect. And if they're lucky, they can add a technician to support the team. Um, but one of those people, probably that middle one, um, the second down, the one who does the validations will be um, the one expected to manage all of regulatory compliance. But the problem is, you know, this person is a design engineer or a product development engineer, an R&D engineer, a QA specialist, and regulatory gets uh, added to their roles and responsibilities. Um, their job descriptions do not talk about regulatory compliance. Typically, it's a that the, the job description is about designing products and yet they're expected to um, fulfill regulatory compliance duties. And so what I've seen is uh, there's a learning curve 
you know, maybe they are an EMC specialist, but there's other disciplines as you're going to see in this webinar. Um, there's learning curves for other disciplines is outside of their wheelhouse that they have to come up with. Uh, coupled with the workload is they end up, you know, always being behind, especially when you're dealing with vendors in, 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 in Asia or something and you're, you're supporting, you know, uh, 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, you're supporting these, these teams in other regions, you get burned out. And the problem is being overworked can lead to mistakes, but also foster a minimalist approach, doing just the minimum needed to get to the next phase of product development and not taking the, the needed time to do the checks, right? Either EMC or product safety checks to make sure that you're on the right track. And so this could lead to failures in the, in the formal, uh, the finals as we call them. And um, the problem is at that point, the entire organization is excited. They think they're ready to launch and you have a failure and sometimes the failure requires a refab and then nobody's happy. And sometimes the board is not happy and that poor regulatory engineer is the one with the bullseye on his back. So what is one of the solutions is to have somebody when your company gets to it to be the administrative compliance engineer that provides all of the um, paperwork and the interface with the labs and you know, manages all of the pre-planning, the scheduling, the, the post uh, documentation control. Um, and, you know, you could call them a regulatory engineer, compliance engineer, compliance coordinator, uh, but a librarian, archivist, and in many cases, even that person at a certain job will, will have all of those and, and more. Um, as a company gets bigger, you'll start to silo it into different disciplines. Um, but it's good to have somebody that kind of serves independent from a different, from any given department, as you'll see in the next few slides. Um, but you need somebody who can develop a regulatory roadmap that's not just within one department, you need, because there's, you, you're, you're going to see in the next few slides, there's other departments to have to deal with. Um, so you need someone to focus on the regulatory roadmap to, to develop it and then to manage it as it unfolds, right? As you go from concept to prototype and getting close to the finals. Um, and somebody can support the design engineers at the lab, um, should there be a failure or what have you. Um, and you need somebody to, that you know that can know exactly where all of the documentation is. Most authorities only give you a certain amount of time to produce evidence. And you need somebody whose, whose thumb is on the pulse of, of the, of the regulatory uh, processes to be able to, to provide the needed documentation. So here's what I'm talking about, about you know, departmental symbiosis. Most of these types of efforts, you know, designing for compliance are gonna start with engineering. Um, there's so many different aspects to product development that do uh, start with engineering department, um, whether it be the EMI, EMC, uh, the sourcing of parts, and maybe a second sourcing, um, to, you know, declaring conformity, creating technical files, managing the interfacing with uh, product safety, um, working with the management on for, forecasting the compliance spends uh, for a certain project or an annual budget uh, for, for their uh, aspects. And then of course, vendor oversight. Many companies have a system and they buy things like AC adapters and you need to look over that vendor shoulders to make sure that the uh, regulatory compliance documentation is accurate. Uh, typically that all happens in engineering. Um, operations, there are some uh, requirements that are post launch, like reuse, recycle, we call that WE in, in Europe, but other uh, regions call it e-waste. Um, <clears throat> and you've got something that is managed after um, launch. So typically I see this uh, being in operations. Um, you've got engineering change order approval process that the regulatory compliance person will get pulled into to give advice. So for example, if you're going to do a replacement of a part um, or, or FAI assistance, you know, what are the regulatory um, consequences to swapping out parts? Um, and of course, sometimes logistics uh, will be housed in operations and a lot of the uh, trade issues uh, come out of operations. And so the regulatory compliance person will have to know about HS codes and 
will often get pulled into working with operations. I went backwards there. A QA department, um, typically you'll see uh, what I've seen is uh, disciplines like Rojas and Reach, we're even talking substances of high concern, um, typically will be, you know, um, operated out of the QA department. Um, also, the, the, the labels um, come out of QA, document approval process, the, the, the doc control and archiving, um, quality management sister, systems, SSOPs, CAPAs, um, all of these, the regulatory uh, uh, point person uh, will be uh, assisting with um, is something that is be coming out of or to <laughs> uh, the QA departments. Of course, finance, you know, the regulatory person has to do with finance in terms of obtaining quotes from vendors, requesting POs, managing the scheduling, um, on the back end, validating that the invoices are correct from the different vendors. Um, so a lot of interfacing with finance. Uh, legal, right? Making sure that the contracts, the NDAs, statement of work, service agreements are all um, approved and um, blessed. Um, and then if you're a publicly traded company, there's conflict mineral sourcing. And that's typically something that the regulatory professional and legal work together on uh, to roll up the CMRTs for the uh, annual uh, SR filings. Um, and then there's sales and marketing. Sales and marketing need to know, hey, uh, if I go into this market, Mr. Regulatory Point Person, what's the what's the the turnaround and cost? So there's regulatory roadmaps that sales needs to get. Um, what are the regulatory consequences of coming up with a new, you know, customer improvement version? Uh, what, what what that might cost? Um, hey, I, I'd like to add an accessory to our system from this new vendor. Um, can you look over their, their regulatory documentation, make sure it's approved before we agree to buy um, something and sell it? Uh, then you've got the uh, software firmware. Um, if you're going to go into multiple international markets, the, you have to uh, work with the firmware team to make sure that the uh, frequency allocation um, parameters are um, set properly. And so there's coordination with the software team for other things as well, making sure uh, there's, you know, uh, the, the throughput, latency, interoperability, all of, all of that uh, sometimes falls with the regulatory compliance person. Um, and the thinking is, well, you're already dealing with all the vendors, you might as well deal with a uh, interoperability lab as well. So sometimes that falls to a regulatory person to manage the smoke testing. Um, Sourcing department, of course, it's very important to make sure the buyers are only buying uh, the right types of parts. Certain parts require recognitions. So there's interfacing with that regulatory person with sourcing to make sure things are being acquired, uh, you know, sourced and bought properly. Um, and what kind of data, uh, data do you need? What reports and certificates must that part have before we agree to, to take it on? So there's symbiosis between regulatory and sourcing. Um, this slide here will give you like a, a visual to kind of look at some of the main disciplines involved in developing a product. You've got your EMC, electromagnetic compatibility, and I'll do some definitions of what that is here on the next few slides. Uh, product safety, um, not to be confused with electro safety, this is how safe the product is in a given environment. Um, and I'll go into a little bit about what that is in a few slides. Uh, mechanical testing, so most of the time that is um, for internal validation purposes, but for some disciplines like NEBS, it's also part of regulatory, at least market-driven regulatory. Uh, substances of high concern, that's uh, the Rojas, the REACH, California Prop 65, uh, TOSCA, which just got pushed back, or at least there's a there's a, a EPA issued something just last week to push that back even a few more years. Uh, but we're seeing more and more countries adding these types of um, SVHC restrictions. And the same with the reuse recycle. There's more and more um, countries and states even here in the US. And I'll have a slide on, on what, what states are proposing this year to add reuse recycle to their requirements. And then energy efficiency. So you have to also be aware of certain uh, energy efficiency requirements, not just how efficient it is, but 
in some countries you have to register that AC adapter with the government agency website. So um, there's a lot that goes into making a product and selling. This is just a quick visual. So um, EMI, this is typically for um, the unintentional portion of the device, a, a digital device. Um, and what we're, we're talking about here is a disturbance that affects the electrical circuit due to either electromagnetic induction or electromagnetic radiation. In layman's terms, you want to be able to, to demonstrate that the potential or the propensity of your device to interfere with another device is below a certain threshold. And we do that through listening to the device. Um, you'll see the, the, the photo at the bottom, there's an antenna there and there's a turntable on the other side of the chamber. Um, so that antenna will be taking readings from the device under test and documenting this below a certain threshold. Um, you can uh, rotate the antenna uh, vertically. So you're taking vertical and horizontal um, as well as going up and down in height to make sure you capture the whole area around the DUT. Um, but the, the two that we're talking about here are radiated and conducted emissions. Um, that's energy coming off the, 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 the chip, like a light bulb that's radiating out into the air. And then you've got the conducted emissions where the energy is going down the power line. One base test will cover um, reports that could be written for uh, US and Canada comes, comes with that. Um, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, to, to Taiwan, Korea, and you can use that data for the EU. Um, you can either use the CISPR32 data and extrapolate to the FCC or vice versa. Um, now, EMI incidental, that's the incidental is interference. And let me just take a, a, one quick step back and say that the way to understand this for people who are really just getting into the industry is if you have a toaster, that toaster needs power. You plug that um, power cord into the receptacle and it's an electrical device, right? As soon as you add a chip to make a fancy display, it becomes electronic. That's where issues of EMI uh, pop up. Um, on the electrical side, we're gonna talk about product safety. That's, that's coming up in the next slide or two slides from now. Um, but you also have potential uh, you know, incidental interference that could happen um, from the power core of the toaster to a nearby device that's also plugged in. So there is a test for uh, even electrical devices that could have in, in, in incidental uh, interference. But then we go into talking about EMC. And within EMC, you have unintentional. Uh, that means it's not intended to radiate. Um, and intentional, that would be considered a radio device, right? Um, and Electromagnetic compatibility, the compatibility, the definition is the ability of the device to function in the presence of a certain phenomenon without electrical uh, disturbance. It must be able to handle a, a certain degree of interference while, while being self-compatible. And it must not um, generate more than the specific amount of interference. So um, in Europe, that's the one main country that requires this. Um, the FDA for medical devices has also um, required this suite of susceptibility uh, tests. And these types are the inverse of radiant and conducted emissions. So we're talking radiant conducted immunity, electrostatic discharges, electrical fast transients and surges. Uh, those, the EFT and surge uh, are, are energy injected up the power line. Uh, voltage dips and interrupts representing a, um, a brownout situation. And for some products that, that this applies to, you might have to test the magnetic. Um, on the intentional side, that's when you have a module in your device. Um, and if you have a radio device that requires a TCB uh, issued, um, the, you, you would need a TCB to issue a grant. Uh, in the olden days, uh, they, the FCC would do it themselves, but they punted the ball and they created a TCB program. Uh, these TCBs who are accredited um, are allowed to issue grants, both for um, US, and most all of them are also empowered to issue ICED grants for, for Canada. Now the US does have a modular approval program, which means that um, you can stand on the FCC um, grant of the module, um, which solves the problem of testing that module in your device. 
Um, it also means that on the labeling, you're going to call out the modules FCC uh, ID, not, not need to get one of your own. Um, but you must, just a caveat, you must follow the conditions of applicability that's on that grant when you integrate that module into your device. But if you do follow those conditions, then you're, you're good to go. Um, in Europe, it's self-declarative, but there is no modular approval program, meaning in Europe, you don't get a grant or like in other uh, international countries, you don't get a uh, type approval certificate. It's self-declarative, it's on the honor system. Um, but there, like I said, there's no modular approval program. So you need to test that module in your device and prove that it's, um, that it's uh, passing. Um, there's other countries that require in-country testing, Mexico, Brazil, and China. They also do not have a modular approval program. And then, of course, uh, some, some devices, um, unless they're really low power, most of the RF devices will require SAR. Um, stands for specific absorption rate, which is the, the uh, ability of the device to induce uh, radiation into the tissues of the, of the, the, the human user. Um, and so it's something that is required for all cell phones, laptops, you know, uh, devices that are being used within a certain proximity. Uh, typically, you'll see that the trough there is testing either by the head or by the hip. Um, but if, you're if your device is low power, sometimes you can use a calculated method and skip the actual testing. That's something you need to be uh, planning for when making a product, an RF product. Now, let me break down the, the, the different uh, uh, requirements. So in US and in, 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 in Canada, we have... Uh, within product safety, I should say, within product safety, there's three main concepts. The first one is US and Canada. And that's the uh, National Recognized Testing Laboratory. Um, it's something that's managed by OSHA, that the, the OSHA is the one that accredits and uh, authorizes NRTLs to do what they do, not just to be an NRTL, but also which test standards they're accredited to. Um, and so you can use one suite of tests for, for your Canada and your US. Um, in Europe, there's a European norm uh, set of tests that you will test to. Um, internationally, there is something that's been around, gosh, almost 30 years now. Uh, the IECCB scheme, it's up to 52 member nations. Um, the good thing about these three is that typically they'll have the same base standards. So if you're testing, let's say, to uh, uh, UL62638, um, but you know you're also going to need six, EN 62638 and IEC 62638, and you know what countries within the IEC you'd like to have listed, you can do one suite of tests and cover all three and just have you know, the, the appropriate reports written for those different regions. Um, other things to consider is ingress protection. Um, some safety standards will call out a certain level of ingress protection. Uh, this is the unit's ability to uh, withstand certain ingress of, let's say, dust, hy hygroscopic dust, could be water, um, especially if it's near, you know, uh, the ocean, you could have salt water getting inside. Um, but then you've got other validation type uh, tests, some of which, if you're talking about NEBS, uh, are actually part of the requirements, but you're talking about vibe, shock and vibe, um, temperature cycling, so temperature and humidity, um, cycles with uh, just the, the temperature cycling or it could be temperature cycling with humidity at the same time. Um, a number of different tests to, to see how hard your device is drops um, on the device and also on, on the packaging are, are something that you need to consider both for um, you know internal validation but possibly for market driven standards. Uh, it also helps you in some cases to draft your uh, warranty plan around. Um, then you've got the substance of high concern. We touched on this a tiny bit earlier, but um, you know, Ro Rojas is a ban of 10 uh, substances and it is uh, harmonized. It's part of CE marking. Um, that means all 27 member nations have adopted it as part of CE marking, whereas REACH is not, but REACH is not a ban. It has a certain threshold that if you're below, uh, you're, you're compliant. The problem with REACH is every six months they could add new standard, uh, new substances. 
So your bomb is never really done being scrubbed because if they come out with four or six new substances, then you have to go back and um, re-scrub your bomb. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it typically is not a full scrub, but you just have to check which parts may have the new substances that are called out. California Prop 65 has a lot more. It's, it's, it's above 700. Last time I think it was 711. Um, but there are workarounds. Um, there are statements that can be made uh, to avoid testing, but um, some, some consumer electronics are high targets for um, people who would like to sue and, and, and see the company settle out of court. Um, the way that the regulatory framers of California uh, started Prop 65, there is no enforcement authority. Every citizen of, the, of California could, if they feel that they have standing, like they bought the product and were exposed to it, could sue. So um, the best practice, really the full, full Monty would be to do a toxicology testing, a toxicology lab, have a safe harbor report written by a third party, a toxicologist. And that safe harbor report uh, is what will uh, keep you from uh, having to settle out of court because the report proves you know, um, conformity. Um, we're also seeing in, in Europe um, and in the UAE, uh, countries, they're asking for a risk assessment, which says, all right, you're declaring conformity to, uh, uh, to, re to Rojas. Um, how did you arrive at that? You know, what, what due diligence can you show that, um, you know, gave you the indication you could declare? <laughs> so it could be something as simple as a one-page report describing your, your process. Um, but they're one, these, are the, these other countries want to see more than just a declaration. Um, the reuse recycle, this is um, a little complicated. You see the, there's 91 standards because you've got your ITE for 27 member nations. You've got your battery. Um, you've got a, a, a third one that when you add it all up, there's a lot of different standards because it's not harmonized. So each member nations have their own little flavor of, of how to reuse recycle. But the basic premise is whatever you're shipping into Europe, you need to have a target of 65% reuse recycle. And um, you can do that through having instructing users of how to get RMA or end of life products back to your headquarters. You have a, some way of tracking that along with uh, um, registering, subscribing to a European or a pan-European um, producer scheme, which is a fancy word of saying a, a recycling uh, scheme throughout the 27 member nations. Um, and there are ways to uh, set your regulatory page and your website up such that there could be a, a postal code finder that tells the user the closest recycling center to them and they take it to them. And if you've registered, then you've also given that recycling scheme your um, schematic and your bomb and they know what's in there and they know how to recycle it. And they will issue a report that that pan-European scheme, they'll issue a report once a year to tell you how much was taken to their locations. And you combine that with your internal tracking for products that return straight to you. Um, and you can demonstrate that you've been, you know, you, you have due diligence to show you've been trying to comply with this. Um, it has been spreading. Um, we see that Germany has their own, again, this is not harmonized. So certain countries have taken this up a, a really higher notch and have been issuing fines recently. Um, India uh, just came online with their e-waste and they've been issuing f fees this year. Um, in, in the US, you're talking Oregon and Maine, but there's 17 other countries, excuse me, uh, 17 other states that have legislation pending to have some type of e-waste uh, requirement. So it's something that as a device manufacturer, you need to be cognizant of and plan for. For, for products that go into a hazardous location, they have a similar approach to the product safety uh, that I talked about earlier. So you have North America, intrinsic safety. You have Europe that has an ATEX program and International IEC um, has an IECX or EX. And, um, um, again, you can work with a uh, Haslock test lab or have a consultant to help you plan for this. 
but once you could do one suite of testing and then come out with a certificate. Um, you could also go the enclosure route, but there's still um, work to do to, to prove that even within the housing, uh, you're, 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 you're safe in these, in these very hazardous environments. Um, you, as a startup, uh, and I, I base this whole uh, webinar today on, on the premise that a lot of companies attending are startups. Um, something you need to start planning for early, not at the last minute, is what, what your label should look like, what countries you're going into, what are the marks that have to be on there. Um, if you have a display, could you take advantage of any e-marking uh, options to save real estate on, on your device? Um, and you, you can, you can definitely use, use it if you have a display, you can find a way to, and we can help you, uh, give you guidance on how to set it up so you still meet the e-marking requirements. Of course, then there's user's guide. What phrases are required in what country and which countries require that those uh, phrases be uh, translated into their um, language. Um, and then you've got, you know, international approvals as, as a concept, as, a, as one set of objectives. So once you've got US and Europe, which is what we call the base countries, um, then you can start looking off into you know, Asia Pacific, South America, you know, Africa, um, different countries around the world you might want to sell to. Um, and as I kind of talked about on the software slide, you need to be able to uh, modify your device and the firmware to make it operate within certain frequencies. And then within those frequencies, you know, uh, the channel spacings that are specified and what power levels um, it needs to operate within each channel. So there's, there's a lot that goes into that in terms of planning. And then of course, there's other documentation that needs to be gathered. And under the design for compliance, a lot of this can be done, you know, during, before, or during the prototype stage. So when you're ready to do testing for years in Europe, you could be ready right then and there to, to start the process and do a submittal for an international country. Most companies I see, they, they finish US and Europe and then they start on preparing for and uh, planning for international deployment. And that could take another two to three or four month turnaround. Um, just a real quick uh, description of a system. If you're going to make a, a system, um, you're not just going to focus on the core device you're not just responsible for that, you're responsible for everything that you're selling in that system. Even if all the accessories are made by a third party, it's still on you as the, the, the manufacturer and the one that's introducing um, the product for sale. And let me just, since I just said that, let me, uh, before I forget, mention the way most of these countries work, like Europe, it's not, um, was it certified before I shipped? No. It's, was it compliant before I offered it for sale on the market? So keep that in mind. Um, the FCC used to have an enforcement bureau here in the US where they would go to trade shows and they would, uh, they would actually issue fines for companies that didn't have a certain display saying, uh, this is not for sale. This is uh, something we're in the process of testing to um, because if not, you, 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 you could get a fine. So you have to, before you offer for sale, you must have these, uh, these certifications in place. Okay, so we're talking about here, I'm gonna give you um, a quick description of a system. So this picture is talking about a core device. This is a radio enabled mesh. Me it works in a mesh, a Wi-Fi mesh environment. It's a one touch voice activated radio. So typically you're, it's, a, you know, it's worn around your neck you touch the button once and it uh, can talk to other users in that uh, environment, let's say it's a hospital. And so you could have hun literally hundreds of these in a hospital, um, all working in the same mesh network. Um, but this device will have a battery and those batteries need a battery charger and the battery charger needs an AC adapter. So the core device has its own requirements, right? You've got your unintentional uh, EMI and EMC, and then you've got your, um, you've got your intentional, you know, your wireless testing, you've got your SAR testing, product safety, 
Of course, it needs its substance of high concerns and, and its ITE we. But that device uses a battery. The battery will also need unintentional EMC, battery testing, product safety on the cell and the pack. It needs substance of high concern, it needs we, um, uh, validation uh, testing. And when it comes to Prop 65, the back of this unit, remember I said it's a lanyard based device. So if it's sitting there and the nurse has an open, an open shirt, it could be touching on the skin all day. So this would this device would be a high target for Prop 65. Um, so definitely, when you have something touching human skin for that period of time, you definitely want to do your due diligence, go be above and beyond, and make sure that you've got your Prop 65 uh, done right. Um, then the charger, the charger itself needs unintentional EMC. It needs product safety. It needs energy efficiency if, as as a BCS. Um, BCS meaning battery charging system, which is the charger plus the adapter. And even when you get your energy efficiency data, you have to upload it to the CEC, California Energy Commission. Um, and if you don't, you can get a fine. It needs Rojas and Reach and we for ITE. Um, the adapter, it also needs an intentional EMC, product safety, energy efficiency, but this is on the EPS. Um, and uh, if it's as part of a B, as part of a battery charger, it will need to go to the CEC. Um, but as just as an adapter, it will need to be registered with Australia through E3 and also to Canada under the NRCAN program. It also needs Rojas and Reach, and it also needs We. The lanyard, uh, they may need Rojas and California Prop 65. You sometimes from the packaging directive, you have to look at the adhesive and the inks. Um, for packaging directive, you have chemical restrictions as well as reuse, recycle. There's a lot that goes into, you know, um, getting a product ready to, to, to offer for sale. Um, so that covers most of the different, you know, pieces of the device. But then you've got other requirements that may need to be considered. If you recall a few seconds ago, I talked about the lanyard sitting on a nurse's chest or the doctor puts it in his lapel, um, which is how most doctors use it on their, on their, white, their white coat, you know, their lab coat. Um, so you may need to do telemetry testing, which uh, shows that, you know, in that proximity to the pacemaker that this radio enabled device is still below a certain uh, propensity to cause interference with the pacemaker. Again, that's not something regulatory, but it's definitely something for market driven to give the users of the device peace of mind that that device is, is safe for them. Um, I touched on this uh, slightly before, but for publicly traded countries, you have a sourcing requirement out of, out of the Dodd-Frank bill um, where you must uh, source your three T and G, your tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold. Um, and file that with your SD report annually. Um, the, there is a new requirement that just came into effect in July of this year where you must have an authorized rep in Europe. And there's some other peripheral obligations for different economic operators, but um, as the manufacturer, uh, you need, at the, the biggest uh, game changer that you need to have somebody uh, to be your legal rep in Europe. UKCA has a similar requirement, but that got pushed out till January of 2023. So there's still about 14 months to get ready for UKCA. But in addition to the authorized rep, you also have to have a new DOC, a UK DOC, and um, UKCA mark on device label and packaging. Very simple. That's their version of CE mark, CE marking. Now that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of documents to create, manage, archive, and deliver. Um, and if you're a startup, you know, it's really hard to adequately plan for that. And I haven't even gotten to the design for compliance tips yet. So a lot of people have a great idea. They want to go to market, but they get uh, inundated and swamped when it comes to how much actually goes into all of this. Um, now, when you're planning, right, um, there are some serializations versus parallel options. You can do a lot of things in parallel um, that um, could help you save time to get to these markets. 
Um, the biggest one is getting the docs for different disciplines, the docs gathered now. Um, and a, mo a lot of these also need validation at prototype level, at the prototype stage. Um, of course, you can start ga gathering quotes early on, even before prototype stage, get you know quotes from all the different labs and vendors that you need to do. Uh, it'll help confirm budgets, but also locks in favorable schedules and gives you more time to get more quotes and get a you know, favorable pricing. Uh, but the point really here is you need to generate a regulatory roadmap early on. I suggest the concept phase. Um, and then before considering parallel options, you know, the rule of thumb that we've learned for over the decades is always do EMI, EMC first. Uh, many of the, the fixes that happen in EMI, EMC affect product safety. So uh, we will never, I will never suggest that you, you, you do product safety in parallel, wait till your EMC is done and in the books to actually start. That doesn't mean you can't you know, interface with the NRTL, get the quoting, get the plan with them, the test plan with them all in place and get all that ready. But you don't push the testing button until you get through with EMC. So in terms of sanity checks um, at, up front, you know, at the prototype stage, radiant emissions, we get a quick snapshot of the broad, broad spectrum. We call it a pre-scan, a pre-compliance scan. Um, it'll, tell, it'll show you where any spikes are so you can kind of focus on, you know, what frequency is it at, you know, what might be causing it, and you can start working on fixing this at the prototype stage. Um, ESD is another one that we see uh, failures at. Um, electrostatic discharge, especially with battery-powered devices, is a pro. You know, it's it's just inherently pro a problem to ground it uh, sufficiently if you're not really paying attention to it, and you know. You really don't know if you pass until you run an ESD test. <laughs> and if you fail, then you can start figuring out, you know, what might be causing it, uh, do some different grounding approaches and see if that helps. For radio devices, spurious emissions is a good check uh, to do well ahead of time. Um, that's the one that fails the most in the wireless suite of tests. Once you get those out, you could also do a, a product safety construction review and see if there's any findings that could be found that you can focus on mitigating here at the prototype stage. Um, so when you're considering the milestones to include in your roadmap, I, like I said a few slides ago, start at the concept phase, have a red flag EMC design review performed. So that's in addition to your pre-scan, have a EMC uh, consultant um, who's a design reviewer look over your system, your schematics, your block diagrams, and just see if there's any um, design for compliance uh, principles you might be unintentionally violating. Um, and as I just mentioned in the last slide, have a product safety construction review performed. Um, and most startups don't have that knowledge in house. You wanna uh, hire a compliance consultant to focus on, on where you are at that point. Um, now, these are things to consider when you're doing a pre, pre compliance sanity check. Um, and my little definition here that most noise comes from the source due to a rapid uh, change in current or voltage. Um, and a circuit or a, a, a chassis design that allows energy out of the device, right, which makes you call a fail, for example, uh, radiant emissions. Um, is also a source of letting energy in. So, you know, fixing the radiated emissions problems will, can also fix the radiated conducted problems for most times. Um, here's a bunch of different checks that's good um, to keep in mind to consider when you're doing this um, check, this overall um, design check. Um, this can be done by a consultant or there's lots of different tools out there, software tools that can run this on your device. Um, automatically save you time. Um, other things to, to consider um, when you're placing decoupling capacitors close to power uh, pins, you know, if, if it is wiring, then make sure that the wiring is short as possible. And the clock wiring as well, keep, keep those as, as, as short as possible. Um, you want to avoid any antenna factoring. Um, if you've got copper that's isolated, um, you want to ground it 
to avoid potential antenna forming, uh, you know, creating antenna forming tracks. Regarding power and ground nets, minimize those loop areas because that could also act as, a, as an antenna, as a receiving antenna. Um, and monitor the proximity of your wiring that generates the noise, which is active, and then that receives noise, which is you know, passive. Um, and then be aware of insufficient clearance, which can, can result in crosstalk, which the definition of that is when one signal creates an undesired effect on another uh, signal. Um, and then put together your final for formal um, testing writ regimen. Um, and a lot of companies will go to the test lab and say, okay, test lab, give me a quote. Um, but if you go and shop around that same device to multiple labs, you start to get, especially if it's a radio, some, some labs might add a certain test and others might not have that test on there and you're wondering why. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if you get a, a set of passing data and if the authorities, let's say in Europe, want to know why it was that you chose that test plan, um, they don't care that you say, oh, the test lab told me to do it this way. So, you know, if you're going to hire an EMC consultant to do the design reviews, also ask them to look at your, um, your product, the countries you want to go to, and, and, and pay a little lecture and have him develop a test plan, him or her um, to develop a test plan. Um, and then, you know, your, your job as a manufacturer is to tell the test lab what to test to. You shouldn't just leave it to them to tell you. So just keep that in mind. Um, but you want to have your formals all mapped out. You want to have um, the, the, the different schedules already lined up well ahead of time. You don't want to wait to the last minute. Um, and then here are some other best practices to consider. Um, it's something that's overlooked by a lot of startups. Um, the documentation uh, pr, you know, quality management of, of, of the documentation. Um, it could really be a gotcha later on. So at first you have one device, you've got either documents secured on C drives or a shared drive, but it's done in such a way that it's not very uh, efficient. And over time, it can actually become very complicated. And I've, I've have, I have a PO from a company just last week that I have to recreate all the reports. They literally lost all the reports to 21. They lost 21 reports. <laughs> it happens. Um, so you wanna have best practices when it comes to um, document, document control, right? Have workflows for different document types that you, know, you could tie it into the disciplines, you could tie it into the countries, but typically it's best by discipline in my opinion. Um, have a decoupled uh, repository for all these compliance documents. Um, don't forget about using metadata to help you find uh, specific uh, di discipline reports or by model or by family. Um, and then, you know, protect the data integrity, make sure that it's uh, not uh, susceptible to being ransomware, for example, right? That's another problem I've had in the last year, companies who had their reports part of the ransomware um, uh, situation. And that's that was most unfortunate. Um, so you wanna consider how it is that you manage your, um, your, your documentation. So here at um, iCertify, we have put together a fully encrypted certificate repository that gives uh, the manufacturers the ability to manage and track all global type approval certificates within a single interface. Um, and it's not just certificates. So for example, um, you do your testing this year and then you want to go to other countries in a year, year and a half. And let's say you want to sell it in Taiwan. Well, Taiwan has a one year uh, requirements. So it's like a stale data, a stale data um, uh, approach. So within a year, you can't use that data again. In other countries, there are different terms, um, but certificates definitely have different terms. You know, some countries will be a one-year term or a three-year term or a five-year term. Some countries are permanent. Once you get an approval, you're permanent. Um, you know, we have one device, one system, 
and you're selling that and you're doing one per year, you could, you could try to do this internally with spreadsheets, but you've got multiple product lines, multiple families, uh, this can get way, way beyond you. So you wanna have a system like this to help give you better control. Um, and you can set it up in such a way that you can quickly find things by the brand, the model number, the country, the expiration date, certificate number. Um, it'll send notices out, uh, like for example, with the stale data, it'll send data saying your, 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 your EMC data that is, could be used for, could, is becoming expired in these countries. But especially for certificates, it'll let you know that uh, let's say in Brazil, your, your, your certificate's about to become due in 90 days. And then in 60 days, it sends you out another um, notice. In 30 days, it sends you out another notice. So it's giving you uh, these emails to let you know, you know, do you want to renew it? Now's the time um, because it's a lot cheaper to renew a certificate than just to let it lapse and then recreate a new, um, a new certificate. Um, the one nice thing about iCertify is it gives you a nice dashboard so you can view all the certificates you have in there. Um, you can quickly grab the PDF and it shows you which certificates are expiring soon. And so that's really good to, to also have this uh, dashboard glance at a view. Um, and it, it's very easy to add new certificates. Um, the one thing about iVault is you, it doesn't have to be anything that I certify issued, it could be your other certificates you've gotten through other vendors. You can have all of your certificates from multiple vendors housed here um, to take advantage of the algorithms and the notification-based system. Um, you, you can have multiple users in the, in the uh, manufacturer, but um, each one can have unique logins, so different permissions granted to different people. Um, but you could also have, um, the ability to, to give access to certain um, third parties or clients if you wanted to. Um, it's not something that iCertify charges for. If you're a client, you can have access to, to this system. Um, and it's, it's um, available for expert assistance to gather, identify, and accurately enter each compliance document, meaning it's easy for you to figure it out on your own, but for, for companies who've got multiple product lines or multiple families, you know, we can help you uh, set it up as, as efficiently as possible. And that's pretty much my uh, presentation for today. Here's my contact information. Uh, any questions I don't uh, have a chance to answer now as Maddie jumps back in, just uh, email me and we'll address any questions uh, after today. Maddie? Thanks so much, Rob. That was a wonderful presentation. Very informative. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat at this time. If anybody would like to type any questions in the chat or feel free to unmute themselves and ask Rob some questions. We have a couple minutes to do that. Great. Cool, but thanks so much for sharing your contact information, Rob. Sure, if anybody has questions later um, or if you're auditing this, presentation on YouTube. If you've got questions, just email me at this um, email address, and I'll be glad to do what I can to answer any questions. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much for your comment, Jim. Great. All right. Wonderful. Oh, we do have a quick question. Let's see. All right, so we have a question and I believe it's from Dallas and he says, I know the presentation is only supplementary, but is it going to be available for download? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we are recording this presentation and it will be on Riot's YouTube channel. I'm not too sure about the capabilities of downloading via YouTube, <laughs> but um, it will be up there and then we never take it off. So you'll always have access to this. Yes, um, pretty great. Oh, mainly the question was because the visuals were cut off a bit. Yeah, 
So Rob, I know you don't traditionally share out your presentation. However, uh, Thales, if you wanna get in touch with Rob, I'm sure that he is happy to um, talk a little bit more with you about some of the visuals that were cut off. All right, sounds great. So yeah, he's gonna give you an email, but that's all the questions I see. Uh, getting a lot of comments in the chat, Rob, about how insightful and great presentation it was. And I absolutely agree with all the folks. <laughs> yeah, if, again, if anyone has any questions or you run into anything uh, sticky from a regulatory compliance point of view, um, don't hesitate to ask me. If it's super sticky and by chance I'd happen not to know about it, um, personally, I know who does, if, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. don't hesitate to give me any questions you might have. Cool. Well, that sounds great. I'll let everyone get back to their wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Thank you all for joining us, Rob. Thank you again. We'll see everybody soon. Cheers. Bye.